Sanjay, has this been the year from hell for you? This, you know, it's been, I think, the busiest year probably uh, of my life, which is saying something because, you know, you go through your your surgical training and, and those are the, those, that time period is just designed to be challenging. You're working 100 hours plus a week. But you also kind of know that it's going to end at some point, <laughs> which is which is, you know, it's funny. Human beings don't like count ups. They like count downs. Like if you had told me in January of 2020, you're going to be doing this for 18 months. I would have said, well, that's that sucks. But at least I know it's 18 months. Not like having to count up like the lack of certainty. It makes it this year particularly challenging. You just didn't know when or still when this is going to end. But I'll tell you, you know, the funny thing sort of on a more personal note is that I, I am when I did my final year of residency, I was a terrible person to be around socially because I, all I cared about was talking about the brain or the spinal cord. And I and I just that you, you were so head down in that. And now that I'm 51 years old, many years later, it's the same thing. I, I all I think about, Katie, has been COVID. You know, I viral transmission, how people evaluate risk, social behavior. There's no part of our society this hasn't touched in some way. Um, but I guess, you know, it's maybe surprisingly, I still wouldn't describe it as a tough year, only because. Um, there is some joy in getting so head down in something. I feel like we live such distracted lives that I, you, you kind of get like sort of, you get a little bit about a lot of things. Like I really know so much about this virus. The MR You must feel like you, you have a PhD in virology at this point, right? Yeah. I mean, totally. And, and, and the, the irony is Katie is that this is a novel virus, right? So, I mean, novel actually means something, which which that didn't really strike me until a few months into this either. Like, I think because you said the Ph.D. in virology, the, the irony is that that I think people who had a lot of knowledge about this in some ways. It got in their way because it's very hard to think about something as novel. You, you immediately right. want to put it into a box. It's the box of SARS. It's the box of H1N1, whatever you come up with. But this was novel, which means that if you try to put it in a box, you probably got it wrong. And so, and so they, they had to cast aside their preconceived notions completely. And yes. that's hard to do, right, for a scientist. It's really hard to do. And and it goes against sort of how you think about things. Let's get the best experts. And by the way, I, I think there's really, really value, great value in expertise. Don't get me wrong. But the, what you would do is gr grab the coronavirus experts, grab the pandemic experts, and that was all important. But this virus was just behaving in a totally novel way. I mean, one of the best examples, as you well know, was everybody believed that respiratory viruses really only spread when you were sick. When you were when you had symptoms, that's when you spread. And, you know, the, the guidance was we'll screen people at airports, we'll tell people to stay home if they're sick, which people should do anyway, regardless of whether in a pandemic. And we should be able to quell this thing. No one really believed initially uh, that this thing would spread most efficiently when people didn't have symptoms. That that was that's never really happened before, as, it, as Dr. Fauci has said, never in the history of respiratory viruses has that happened before. That's novel. Again, I think asymptomatic tra transfer, asymptomatic transfer. I mean, you know, you remember the story of typhoid Mary. She was a silent carrier of typhoid. It was so dramatic because she infected all these people in this single residence and in this community and all that. And people couldn't figure it out. This is like millions of typhoid Marys in a way of a of a brand new disease, COVID. So it is. it, it was quite extraordinary to sort of see that, uh, see, that, see how that all played out. Well, before we talk about your, your new book, Keep Sharp, because I'm really interested as someone who's 64 in maintaining my mental uh, acuity as I age, I, I just want to ask you one last question about COVID. And that is, are we seeing the light at the end of the tunnel? Every time I feel optimistic, Sanjay, I then read something about variants or increased cases and it's quite nerve wracking, I think, for the average person who doesn't have a medical degree or hasn't been deeply, deeply entrenched in the science of this. I mean, are we screwed? Are we 
at the tail end of this pandemic. I, I, I do feel the light on my face and in your face. I mean, I, I do think that the the, the tunnel is is uh, the end of the tunnel is in sight. I mean, the the um, can can I just can I just remind people? And I think this is such an important reminder that they were having rave parties in Wuhan at the end of last summer. And I bring that up only to say that we talk about the vaccines. We talk about the fact that science is now rescuing us, which is great, fantastic. But th- so much of this didn't need to happen. And I, and, I, and I know that's not your question, Katie, but I just feel like I can never answer a question about, um, about the sort of future of, or being optimistic about this pandemic because I'm so, it's just so, it's so, I'm so angry in so many ways. I mean, you know, 600,000 people died and I, some of them are my friends and, and I've seen families. I talk to families still. I just, it, it just, this may not have even been the black swan event, right? We think of this black swan event, this really contagious virus, which this was, but something that has a two to 3% mortality, that would be awful. That would be the black swan event. This wasn't even that. There were countries around the world that immediately quelled this and measured their deaths in the hundreds instead of the hundreds of thousands. Having said that, we are a society because we are we focus on touchdowns and home runs and knockouts. We don't care much for singles and doubles. Because we're that society, we waited for science to rescue us. And and the vaccines, will. I think they're really extraordinary and really effective. They seem to be pretty effective against the variant uh, B117, the UK variant, because there's a lot of concern about that variant. But if you have been vaccinated or if you had the infection in the past, the other, you know, the, the circulating coronavirus, that should also protect you. So it's really, I think it's really good. And I think with the warm, warmer weather in the summer, viral transmission rates will go down. That'll be great. I do think, you know, um, we'll probably get to herd immunity over the summer. But, but it's worth reminding that herd immunity isn't a sort of destination necessarily. You can pop in and out of herd immunity. So if not enough people get vaccinated uh, over you know, the next few months, then going into the colder weather again in the fall, we could see resurgences. It's quite disturbing. Gosh, there's so many questions I want to ask you, Sanjay, but it's quite disturbing when you hear about the people who are refusing to get vaccinated. Many uh, of them are white men uh, in this country. Uh, I think you see the impact of politics on that number, not only in terms of the response to the pandemic, but now to the response to the vaccines. Uh, That must be quite disturbing for you too it is for me yeah i i th- i mean there's been no not a single part of this entire pandemic that hasn't been politicized in some way i mean that's i guess now you say that uh, in in april of 2021 and it's obvious right everyone knows that but start starting off covering the story um, and now, all the way now to the vaccines, even every single component has been politicized in some way. So it is it is disturbing. The anti-vax movement, and you may not even remember this, Katie, but I actually did a segment on your your um, show years ago about um, anti-vaccination movement at that time around H1N1. So that you know, right. this is quite some time ago, but. It's been around for a long time, the anti-vaccination movement, and it's sort of, you know, it simmers. It, it we saw measles outbreaks in Brooklyn and and Disneyland and Min- but Minnesota. But this seems this seems bigger though, Sanjay. You know, this is that bigger. was a, a particular group, uh, and it really dealt primarily with with childhood vaccinations. And now this has expanded to, um, you know, these adults who. I don't know, for one reason or another, I think you can understand people of color and the the terrible history of Tuskegee and some of the ways that people of color have been abused in scientific research in the past and this kind of deeply ingrained mistrust of the medical community. So I think you can appreciate that, but this is, you know, this is a whole other ball of wax, isn't it? Yes, it, it, it really is. And, and, you know, we're, we're seeing some of this for, or really seeing it come to light, I should say, you know, in a, in a pretty dramatic way. Now, I think, I think I was reading the statistics this morning, Katie, Kaiser Family Foundation, 40 to 50 percent of those in rural areas who, who say they absolutely will not take the vaccine. It's not a question of, hey, I want more information. I want to see how this plays out. They're just saying out of the gate, they absolutely not take it. And, um, uh, 
40. What's it? What is the explanation? Uh, so that's the that's the curious thing. Like you said, with some uh, people who are vaccine hesitant, it is concerns about safety or mistrust or, you know, uh, my my grandfather was experimented on as part of Tuskegee, you know, things like that. With this, I think it's almost an extension of this pandemic uh, isn't even real. It's not a hoax. Why would I take a vaccine for something uh, that's a hoax? I, I'm not scared for safety of it. I just don't. I think the whole thing is sort of, you know, the scamdemic sort of thing. So I don't know if that's the case for it's a huge percentage of people we're talking about here. So maybe there's a some heterogeneity, you know, uh, some variety of opinions there. But Bottom line, if, if if the numbers stay that high, we're not going to get to herd immunity based on vaccinating adults alone. We would need basically really depressing. <laughs> it's 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 so I mean, gosh, we wait for science to rescue us. We don't do the basic public health practices. And then when the, when this truly extraordinary scientific achievement occurs in the form of this vaccine, people don't take it. it you know, if you're a Martian coming to planet Earth and saying, so what, what, let me get this straight. <laughs> So you, you didn't do anything about the virus. You waited, created this amazing medicine, and then you don't take the medicine. To, I, it just it doesn't make any sense. It's a head scratcher for sure. Yeah. Um, and uh, I think we. Wait, I wanted to ask you one more. Oh, sure. When do you think Sanjay will be able to go about our daily lives without masks? I, th I think it'll be this summer, Katie. I, I, I really do. I mean, I know that there's people who are painting a more dire prediction around that. But, you know, we, if for no other reason alone with the warmer weather, and then you're going to really see the blunting, despite the vaccine hesitancy that we're talking about, you are going to see a significant blunting of people who are getting very sick, people who are dying. And we know that the vi the vaccine does seem to have good evidence that it stops or decreases transmission. So I think we're really going to get to a pretty good point. I think you'll still see masks around. You know, in, in Hong Kong, after Hong Kong really wasn't a mask wearing country until after SARS. And then there was this huge psychological impact. That's why they went to masks so early in Hong Kong, but they became a mask wearing culture. I think you will see people who are just frightened still want to wear masks in public places. I think in flu season, you know, the colder months, I think you'll see more masks. I think that may become a, a larger part of our culture, not a dominant, but I think a larger mm -hmm. part of our culture. That's interesting because I remember being in Tokyo, maybe, gosh, gosh, maybe 10, 10 or 12 years ago and going on the train to Kyoto and seeing everyone wearing masks and thinking, this is so weird. Why are they wearing masks? And now, of course, I understand. And you're right. I think when people are on places like public transportation, if they're in closed spaces with lots of strangers, um, it actually makes sense, doesn't it? I mean, you know, one thing we saw, as you may remember, is that the flu numbers were way down uh, right, this, right. this past season. And that, you know, that, that wasn't because of any increase in, in vaccination or anything. That was because of just public health behavior. It's always worked, you know. I don't know. There's a metaphor for this, Katie, right? I mean, we, I, I don't know, I guess it's true in our lives. Like we'd rather just take a pill for weight loss rather than go exercise. Right. I mean, we always want the convenience. And, and th this is, this is another example of that. We, I, I was struck. And, and again, we could talk about COVID all day long, but the, but the, I'll never forget these, these mask researchers from Harvard, a guy named Abrar Karan. He basically was doing all this modeling all along. We were talking to him. He told me that if for four weeks, and this is back, you know, October, November of last year, if for four weeks, everybody just wore a high filtration mask when they went out in public, that's it. For four weeks, if everybody did that, it would have ended the pandemic. Are you kidding? That's incredible. The virus would have had nowhere to go. And eventually it would just sort of wither away. Right. That sort of concept is something that's more than 100 years old. I, I just I just don't quite, you know, I don't know, maybe I'm just being naive, but but you hear that and you think it's amazing, right? I think it's amazing. And yet we also know, both of us, that it, in the United States, that couldn't happen. It just wouldn't right. happen. It reminds me of a, a, a saying that a friend of mine's mom used to say, which is nothing so strange as people. <laughs> You know, I I um I totally agree, and and at times became a little disheartened by that. I guess maybe that's obvious, but but like if I tell you, Katie, hey, you get to be part of a movement that's going to save seventy thousand lives 
all you got to do every time you go outside, just put two ear loops on. And when, you know, millions of people say, yeah, ain't going to do it, I'll pass. I mean, human beings survived and thrived as a species because we're reciprocally altruistic. There's a reason that it feels good to do good. Why should it feel good when I do something nice for you? I mean, what purpose does that serve my evolutionary tree? I don't know. But the reality is that it does feel good to do good. We encoded that in some way in our DNA. And then people can't be bothered to wear a mask to save tens of thousands of lives. I, I just, I'll, that may be one of the greatest mysteries of all out of, out of this whole thing. On a, on a lighter note or a or more optimistic note, Sanjay. We started a little, <laughs> little dark, didn't we? I know. Let's talk about your book. I told you I was a terrible, terrible, boring sort of, I mean, can you imagine no, me at a cocktail like, party right now? No, <laughs> like, get this guy out of here. What's he? I mean, in a way it's, it's depressing and yet it's fascinating, right? On just a, a, a psychological human scale to, to try to understand human behavior. And I hope that from this pandemic, uh, perhaps public health experts will be trying to understand the psychology of people and how to motivate them in a more effective way. And I think, you know, I don't wanna politicize this, but it's really impossible not to. And I think so much of this uh, is because of the leadership in this country and the way it was handled. and. I think that hopefully that will translate into people's political choices because, um, you know, I mean, we could talk about this all day, Sanjay, but science, of course, was was really having a, an identity crisis or, or a crisis of confidence. That's more accurate in terms of people domestically and internationally feeling confident in science. We saw this with climate change. We saw this with a lot of you know, pressing issues in, in our world. And I was heartened to see that our faith in science increased during the pandemic. But, you know, that I think played into this somewhat. And then you had a president who totally capitalized on that and, and almost ripped open uh, this festering sore of mistrust and, and poured, literally poured, poured salt into it in terms of the way he responded. So, um, you know, I hope that there are some really important lessons learned for us as a society. And, and maybe we can talk about the political ramifications in a way that in the future, this won't happen again. I right. don't know. A girl can dream, right? <laughs> Yeah, well, I think I think it's a really wor worthwhile dream. I mean, I think that that that's that's got to be what we hope for out of this. These lessons, I will tell you. You know, um, the scientists. I was talking to Dr. Fauci a, a couple months ago, and I remember he sent him saying something to me about data that was showing that scientists were increasingly being increasingly perceived as arrogant, which I thought was really interesting. Is that recently? Yeah, I think he said it was, you know, the end of last year sometime. Uh -huh. And um, not that they weren't trusted, but they were perceived as arrogant. And and I remember thinking, you know, um, like you can give objective data, but how that data is interpreted is always a subjective thing, right? Like if I tell you something is 0.5% lethal, a lot of people will say 0.5% lethal, so one in 200 people are going to die? I mean, we better be careful. We better take cover, you know, just just let's... let's, let's uh, act on this. Uh, another percentage will say, well, that means I'm 99.5% good, right? Why the big deal? It's not that the objective data is different. It's the same. That's the data. But unless you account for the subjective interpretation of that, you, I, I don't think you're fully doing your job, whether like reporters or, or public health advocates or whoever, you know, you've got to contextualize this in, in a way that's that's meaningful. And I think that was a big lesson as well. You could you could mm -hmm. totally say, well, ninety nine point five percent good. And everyone says, yeah, that makes sense. That's math. Ninety nine point five percent good. But you forget that one in two hundred people, you know, it, it just it's that that's, you know several kids in a school or several people at a university or in a nursing home, whatever it might be. Anyways, it just, that, that part of it was striking as well. Yeah. You know, actually I can understand now that I think about it, why some might view scientists as arrogant. I think it's a continuation of this anti-intellectualism that has pervaded our society and um, the, the death of expertise, 
right? I think it becomes a class issue about the educated versus uneducated, you know, the coastal elites versus people who are more working class. And I think sort of the view of science really actually incorporates some of those attitudes as well. And, um, you know, and, and, you know, quite frankly, that has seeped into the media culture. It's so bifurcated and, you know, tribal that I can understand why, you know, people might view scientists because they are associated with a certain media outlet or they're, you know, I mean, it's, it's, I think a number of, of forces at work there. I, I think I think you're absolutely right. And, you know, we, we saw it just really be laid bare, I think, during this pandemic. A lot of those things, maybe they existed, uh, but we just didn't see it as much before. I mean, I, I, I think people also demand 100 percent certainty when it comes to science. Right. I, I think right, science is right. often thought of as math. Right. Two plus two equals four. That's that's a fact. Science, in some ways, is more like art than it is like math. I mean, it has to be. It has, We constantly are learning, you know? Right. I mean, and I think that people took advantage of like these, these, um, you know, well, we've learned this and it is, it is, uh, it, it, we saw it unfold. And then that, for some reason, I think people, you know, people need to, to learn how to be critical thinkers, Sanjay, and they need to learn how to take information. I think, you know, when all is said and done, some of what is happening in our country is a real indictment of our educational system. And in terms of what people, how people learn and ingest information and think about it. And, uh, you know, I, I think we have some serious work to do in that area. And, uh, it's, it's, it's a huge challenge, but it's such an important one because somehow we have to, we have to all, all be on the same, same page when it comes to these public health crises, right? Yeah, no, no. You know, it's, it's, um, I got to spend a lot of time with my girls. You just reminded me talking about just education overall. Well, I mean, if there's any silver linings in this whole thing, and there aren't many, but one is that I get to spend a lot of time with my girls. Uh, you know, because they were home and, and I have three teenage girls uh, and, you know, <laughs> it was wonderful. It was, it was actually like, I know. And I was thinking, gosh, wait, this, the, what exactly? hormones, slam doors. You have a much more peaceful house than I did when I had two teenage girls. <laughs> <laughs> right. right. Well, by the way, I'm in my little closet here in the basement, which is where I always escape to, whether I have to do a podcast or not. <laughs> it's getting a little too crazy. That's your man cave. <laughs> but I will say this: I, I is my my time. I wish I could show you this. This is this is terrible. I can't. I mean, it's downright depressing. This little closet. I I had no windows. I have like these little drapes everywhere to like block sound. I mean, it's if you wanted to if you wanted to really make somebody gloomy, this is the room you would design. Sounds very glamorous, Sanjay. <laughs> yes, but but the reason I was what I was going to say though, Katie, is that I am I'm optimistic about my kids. You know, I I, I realize there's an educate you know the educational sort of. Uh, divide, the things you're bringing divide. up, yeah, no, no doubt the divide, but also you know what you're saying this this idea of where is the role of critical thinking in in our educational system? I I don't know, you know, I'm not seeing exactly how they're educated, but they come home asking the right questions, caring about the right things. You know, it's seemingly they they get they got really interested in what was happening with this pandemic and you know, uh, human nature, how people evaluate risk. Teenage girls. I, I, I was I was really, really pleased with that part of the discussion. But I want everyone to have the access to education that your girls do and, uh, you know, the quality of education, which I imagine is 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 pretty high for your girls in Atlanta. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it, they, they go to a they go to a great school. You know, we we um, spent a lot of time sort of thinking about that. And Did they go to a public school or a private school? They go to a private school. It's called Westminster. Oh, I know Westminster. I know a lot of girls who went to Westminster, went to college with me. But, you know, I mean, er, you know, therein lies the problem, Sanjay. I mean, that's not, you could that's, do a whole podcast on public education versus private education. And, you know, everybody deserves the education your girls are getting. And my concern is not everybody is getting it. And I'm lucky too. my girls went to private school as well. 
Yeah, no, no, no doubt. And even, even, I mean, yeah, again, this with this pandemic, they this is a school that was able to afford testing, and you know the ventilation was great in the school, and so we kept our girls out of school uh, at a time when they could still go back because I felt that the numbers were just too high and didn't make sense to me. But they, they had the resources to ultimately be able to 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 create a situation that a lot of schools couldn't. And that, and that and so this pandemic will worsen that divide you're talking Definitely. about. I mean, for some kids, this was more childhood interrupted, and for some kids, this was childhood changed my trajectory for life. I think. Hopefully, you know, if you go back and look at 1918, 1919 data after that flu pandemic, I think there was a consensus that uh, even in school districts that were harder hit um, had some of the same divides. Luckily, there was a resilience, and there wasn't a significant educational gap if you looked forward 20, 25 years after that. But, you know, who who knows? You know, we're, we're experiencing some of this for the first time. Anyway, well, I just want to say on, on behalf of the American public, thank you for your coverage of this. Um, I think you're so measured and uh, so eloquent and and honestly, calming in a way. And I just really appreciate all the fantastic reporting you've done throughout this pandemic. So uh, on behalf of a grateful America, I would like to say thank you, Sanjay Gupta. Well, Katie, thank you. Thank you. And that obviously means uh, a great deal in particular coming from you. So I, I appreciate that. You know, you get it, you know, I mean, you're, you are the standard, obviously, by whom we all measure ourselves. But also, you know, you, we're all in these black holes, right? I mean, I, I don't know where you are right now. As I said, I'm in this tiny little closet. I don't, you don't get any feedback. You know, you don't know right. if your message is landing or not. Sometimes it's been really dispiriting because you think, okay, I'm a medical reporter in the middle of a pandemic. That That is my, you know, it's, that's a job. And at the same time, the country in which I'm reporting arguably did the worst in the world. I mean, I know I keep taking this in that direction, but it's just so dispiriting. Like, did I? Did anyone listen to me? I mean, if 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 you're the medical reporter, and you know, presumably people are are counting on you to provide knowledge, hopefully that will inform how they behave, and then we do the worst in the world. That's that's you know, I'm gonna need to reflect on that. I think uh, you know, in the years to come, like what is the real impact here? One could argue that maybe it would have been worse. Who knows? You know, but it's pretty bad. Well, don't get too dispirited because I think a lot of people listen, relied on you, and actually acted. So thank you. The track record was bad. Uh, your information was good and important. So thank you. I appreciate that. Let's talk about Keep Sharp because moving forward, I think many people like me uh, really are interested in how to keep our cognitive and mental health uh, at, at the top. And I think, you know, certainly one big change in medicine is that we as patients are not uh, passive. You know, I think one of the exciting things that's, that's I think one of the exciting things that has happened in medicine, Sanjay, is people understand that they can play a real role in their health. Certainly, I saw that when I went on my colonoscopy tear and talked about colon cancer screening. And I think we're hearing so much about this. You know, I, I'm a, a, a big fan of Dr. Mark Hyman, who is uh, in what, what kind of medicine do you call that fundamental? And what do you call it? I mean, integrative. Uh, integrative, uh, yeah. Right. Yeah. Yeah, medicine. yeah, medicine. And, and it turns out, Sanjay, that there is a lot of things that we can do to keep our brains in shape, just like we can do to keep our bodies and our organs and other things in shape. And that's why you wrote Keep Sharp. But yeah. you have a very, very personal connection to this, I guess, well, obviously because of your specialty, but particularly about Alzheimer's, dementia, and, and our failing brain power that happens as we age. Tell me about that. Well, when I was, when I was um, 12 or 13 years old, my grandfather, uh, my, my mother's dad, who I was very close to, um, developed you know, signs of, of dementia. Uh, he had had a, a stroke earlier in his life, but had recovered. 
and and was now developing, you know, just these these um, periods of time where he he really wasn't aware of what was going on. He 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 would sometimes uh, make a joke that no one else was in on, you know. And it was all these things that I that I remember really being struck by as a kid because you look at adults and you you're not used to seeing brain power start to diminish. And it was the first time I saw really specific things like he could he could still. Um, write, but he couldn't really read. It was it was all these things that became really fascinating in a way for me in terms of just how does the brain work like that, but also to see it in a loved one to wonder, is that how genetic is that? Is that gonna is my mom going to develop those symptoms? Will I one day? All of that, and then you know, fast forward, you know, thirty forty years later, and and we're still worrying about the exact same things. And and haven't really made a lot of progress in terms of being able to deal with that. So that was a, that was a large part of what I think inspired me to 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 write the book. What has happened over the last forty years, both from a you know a a pharmaceutical standpoint, but also more importantly, I think from a from a lifestyle behavioral standpoint in terms of what we know. And how did that influence you to go into neurology? I know you know it's funny. Um, it didn't. I, I actually, when I started medical medical school, I thought I was going to go into pediatrics, and then I did a neurosurgery rotation uh, during my third year of med school, and I just sort of fell in love. So I came to it quite late. But I was always interested in the brain because of my grandfather, and so it felt like a very natural fit. Let's talk about uh, the numbers, because 47 million Americans have some evidence of preclinical Alzheimer's disease, and by 2060, one new case of dementia will be diagnosed every four seconds. Sanjay, what the heck is going on here? Well, th- this is this will become the the most dominant neurodegenerative disease of our time. I think uh, that that part I think is is pretty well established at this point. But there was two things about the statement that you just made that I thought were really uh, important in terms of what we could potentially do about it. As you point out, there's probably about 47 million people who, if you were to look at their brains, they would have objective evidence of plaques and tangles and things like that, but also have no symptoms. That's the preclinical time, right? So you hear... Okay, you're freaking me out a little. <laughs> well, it's, you know, I, it's, but I think this is ultimately good news, and I'll tell you why. If, if you look at patients with Alzheimer's disease and, and, and able to, to retrospectively look at their lives and their scans and their brains, you find, we now know, that, that Alzheimer's starts in the brain decades before people develop symptoms. Decades. So you're starting to see the kindling and then even plaques and tangles. But here, but the fundamental point that neuroscientists really started to focus on was almost the, the, the analog of that, meaning, okay, so now you've established that you can have a brain that has plaques and tangles but still functions normally. So why don't we focus on that start, side of things? Instead of saying, hey, look, let's get rid of the plaques and tangles, and we have spent billions of dollars testing drugs to do that that haven't really worked, what if we say instead, we have established that a brain with plaques and tangles can function normally? Let's figure out why and see if we can basically make that an aspiration. Do you still have objective evidence of Alzheimer's in your brain? Yes. Is it consequential? No, because y- you, know, you, you are able to still have normal cognitive function, memory, judgment, all the things that you associate with a healthy functioning brain. The metaphor in some ways, Katie, would kind of be like a heart bypass surgery. You got a blocked blood vessel. Now you you go in there and you bypass that area of the blockage with a new blood vessel. Do you still have heart disease? Yes. Is it is it is it causing you some dysfunction? No, because you're getting enough blood flow now to the heart. If you can think about that same metaphor for the brain, yes, you have plaques, but there's so many ways to build all these new pathways in the brain to your destination that little blockages due to the plaques become inconsequential. So is there a tipping point? You know, you talk about these tangles and plaques in your brain. Um, Is it just a slow uh, growth of plaque or slow accumulation of plaque and increase kind of tangles that then lead you from being perfectly functioning 
you know, maybe some memory issues, right? That once in a while you, you, you know, you're not quite as sharp as you were as you, uh, when you were younger, but where you kind of fall off or it's just gradual buildup of this gunk in your brain. Well, it's, it's, it does seem to be a pretty gradual buildup and you can tolerate a significant amount of buildup before you, I guess, as you, as you say, fall off, you know, so what exactly then pushes people over? It's not all of a sudden you have an exponentially more plaque and that leads to the problem. Maybe for different people, it's a different inflection point, but the brain is actually quite resilient. I mean, that's the thing that came out of this, even with a lot of plaque and tangle, you could actually be doing fairly well. I mean, the occasional memory lapse, like you say, which is probably due more to inattention than even anything organic in the brain. But other than that, doing pretty well. And you see societies around the world where arguably brain function, not only is it good, it it may be improving as you get older, you know. Which is so incredible. And that, I think, is one of the hopeful things about this book that that our brains can get sharper and better as we age and dementia is not necessarily an inevitable con- you know, consequence of old age. So, um, you know, I remember reading Sanjay, how your brain, like by the time you're 23 or 24 and then your prefrontal frontal lobe and all this thing that has to stuff that has to do with judgment, like after that, your brain really stops absorbing and, and growing and changing. I mean, that was sort of what I always thought. And then it was downhill from there. But, but this book um, is, is really cause for celebration in some ways, right? Right. Absolutely. You know, it, it, I was told the same thing, right? You got a certain number of neurons in your brain, and then you're going to drain the cash as you go through life. Certain things like drinking alcohol and things like that are going to kill more brain cells. You're never going to get them back. I think that's what our parents. Told that's us what our parents tell us. Drinking. It works well to some extent, but the the uh, you know it, it it but that that part of it is not true, and that that may be one of the most fundamental new things that we learned. And by the way, you'll appreciate this, Katie. I'm in the, in some ways this book. I'm I'm acting as translator. I go to these neuroscience meetings because that, you know, I, I live this bifurcated life between medicine and media, but I'm still going to these neuroscience meetings and they're talking about these fascinating developments. And yet that hasn't really gotten to the, to the lay public yet. So it's about a 10 year gap in some ways, keep sharp is to just accelerate that, that knowledge tree. But one of the things that they've been talking about is exactly what you mentioned, which is neurogenesis. Everyone's heard of neuroplasticity, which basically means you can recruit neurons, brain cells from other areas of the brain to do new functions. This is actually growing new brain cells. And we were told throughout our lives that it basically happened twice, you know, when you were a baby and your brain was still forming. And maybe after an injury, like a stroke or a traumatic brain injury, there may be a process of neurogenesis that occurs. But what these these neuroscientists have have really uh, been writing about and focused on for some time is that at any age, a healthy brain can continue to grow new brain cells. You really can't say that about any other organ in the body. So it's quite incredible, the the stem cell surges, the various growth factors, all these things that converge to allow you to grow new brain cells at any age. That, to me, was deeply inspiring. I mean, I want to do that. It's super exciting, but let me just backtrack for one moment just so I understand the difference between neuroplasticity and neurogenesis. Um, explain it like I'm a fifth grader. Okay. So, uh, the, the, you know, when you think of neuroplasticity, it's more like your brain is, is like plastic. It's, it's can be molded. So let's say there's been an area of your brain where someone had an injury or a stroke or something, you could sort of mold another part of the brain to, to fill the gap. To compensate? Compensate. Yeah, exactly. You know, take, so if it was motor strength, for example, on the right side of your body that was affected, cells brain cells that normally don't do motor function, they're not responsible for motor function, could be recruited to do that sort of work. Or a sense, you know, even if you lose a sense, other senses can start to become heightened or even create. Right. You hear that with blind people, you know, um, in terms of a heightened uh, sense of, I guess, all kinds of senses, right, that compensate for the fact that you can't see. 
Exactly, and and that and that is a that is a uh, uh, it's an amazing concept. It's what sort of gives real birth to physical therapy, to cognitive therapy. We're using these therapies to basically recruit neurons from other parts of your brain to do something it's that awesome. you can't do That's right so, now. The human, the human body, body is, is so, so amazing, 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 isn't it? Isn't it? It, it, it? it continues to wonder and delight me every day. And I've been thinking about this for 40 years. You know, I, I love it. Um, neurogenesis is the growth of new brain cells. So this, 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 this flies in the face of what we were all told when we were young, that you only have a certain number of brain cells and that's it. This is basically saying you can create new brain cells at any age. The metaphor, I think, that may make it more, more accessible is, is right now our COVID life is kind of like how our brain operates. And what I mean is that you probably are at home. You may drive to the grocery store. Maybe you drive to a couple of different places, and you... But you're not you're, you're mostly in, in just a small, small square sort of area of place. You know how to get to all those places really well. You could drive there with your eyes closed. No problem. But but you you're not traveling around the rest of the world. You're not even traveling around the rest of the state right now. That's kind of how our brains are. We use our whole brain. But 90 percent of the time we're using 10 percent of our brains. That's the thing. If you start to actually do things to inspire neurogenesis in your brain, it's kind of like building new cities and visiting those new cities in your brain. That's, it's, it's, a, it's a little bit of a simplistic metaphor, but it makes me really happy to think about it because uh, it, visiting other places in your brain is an incredibly joyous thing. You start to see patterns that you would have otherwise missed. You connect dots. Your thinking is, is, is clearer. And, and, and that's the whole concept of, of, of what neurogenesis can do for you. Well, take me on a trip. What do I do? And how can I visit these new places in my brain? Because this is really exciting. And um, I know your book has a lot of recommendations for ways that we can encourage neurogenesis. So what do I do, Sanjay? Yeah. Well, so, I, you know, the, the way I'll tell you, the way that I, I uh, wrote the book was I took all these these neuroscience concepts and tried to make them accessible and also help you set up a substrate for your brain in terms of, you know, how you nourish yourself, how you rest your brain, things like that. So the basics are there. But your question is more about taking the trip and building the new brain cells. So after you sort of, you know, make sure, and it's not challenging to get to the right sort of place in terms of your diet, you know, uh, and, and the amount of rest that you need, that's important. But the biggest I think difference with growing new brain cells versus how we typically think about strengthening our brain is that you don't necessarily want to just keep doing the same things over and over again. The whole practice makes perfect sort of teaching, the kill and drill sort of teaching that a lot of schools focus on. It's important to, to understand and, and, and be able to learn concepts but that's kind of like those roads I was talking about that you travel so well. That's like getting even better at traveling those same roads. Now you can really do it with your eyes closed. Now, you know, it's, it's, it's totally second nature to you. But if you were to do different things, totally different things, things that get you out of your comfort zone a little bit, uh, a, a totally different sort of hobby, that's when you're starting to actually uh, build some of these new brain cells, create some of these new cities, create some of the new roads, whatever, however, whatever metaphor you want to apply to it. That, that's a, a, a much better way to sort of do that versus the practice makes perfect. So if right, practice right. makes perfect, change is what's going to build the neurogenesis. It's going to build the resilience and, and redundancy in your brain. So I play the piano. Should I not focus as much on the piano? Because I thought about taking lessons, even though I took for 10 years and I play by ear, but I enjoyed the piano and we actually have a beautiful piano uh, that Jay and I bought each other for our birthdays back in the day. Yeah. And, but, but should I learn how to play the guitar or the viol? Oh, the violin sounds just horrible if you're not good at it, but what, I mean, should I try a new instrument? Yeah. You know, so I asked a lot of neuroscientists about this because one thing about writing a book like this is that it affects everybody, right? So even the guys and, and gals who are who are doing all this research, they're thinking about what to incorporate into their own lives. And there are a couple of things that sort of jumped out at me. One is that something new is, I think, really important. That's that's that that is a key. But something that you can also use your hands with that you're actually activating your motor motor cortex as you're doing seems to be even more beneficial. So an, so an instrument is great. 
Um, but should I have an, should I try a new one? Because I can try a new one. Yes. I mean, I mean the piano again, I, I, I want to be careful here. I did this, I, Bill Clinton, I was talking to him about brain health the other day and he, he got on my case because he said he loves crossword puzzles. And he's like, so are you telling me crossword puzzles are not good for, uh, no, no, I'm not saying don't do those things, but understand what you're accomplishing. You are, you are, you're paving those roads really, really well in your brain. And that is great. There's great value in that. But if it is true that you can build all these new roads and the question you're asking me is how to do that, then it would be, it would mean doing something different. So I'm not saying stop playing the piano, keep driving those roads. But if you want to start going on these trips around your brain, doing something different and preferably doing it in a way that may be even a little uncomfortable. So if you're painting, and I just bring up painting because this is the one that came up several times among these neuroscientists, learn how to paint. I'm a terrible artist. Learn how to paint. Do whatever you can and do it with your non-dominant hand. Do it with Really? Your non- yes. This was another, in <laughs> fact, they went so far as to say that tonight at dinner, when you're eating your dinner, try eating your meal with your non-dominant hand and just see what happens. And it's really interesting, Katie, because we think of building the brain means reading books and gaining new knowledge. And, and that's true. But in terms of actually creating neurogenesis, it's more like you think about a physical workout. I'm going to do something different and I'm going to actually now focus the left side of my brain which normally isn't doing motor function that's delicate or fine on actually doing that sort of stuff. It has real relevance because again, you're, you're actually building these roads and these cities in your brain and that's fun. Try it. It's fun. But on a more practical level to your original question, let's say one day the road that you drive so well becomes blocked by one of these amyloid plaques that we're talking about. Some of these tangles, right? Now, you know that road really well, but you know what? You don't really have other roads to get from point A to point B. If you've been building all these roads by <laughs> painting with your left hand and spilling your food by, by eating with your non-dominant hand, whatever it might be, you're actually building roads. This gets back to the bypass analogy. Do you still have mm-hmm. plaques and tangles in your brain? Yes. So are these the cognitive reserves that you're talking about? Yes, the cognitive reserves, the cognitive resiliency, which is often, they often use these terms interchangeably, but that's exactly it. We have the capacity to, to have significant cognitive reserve. We're barely tapping into that. If you look at societies around the world where people are living into their 90s and 100s and have hardly any dementia, the, the presumption now is that if you were to image their brains, they might have plaques and tangles. If you were doing an autopsy, they may be diagnosed with Alzheimer's because that's how Alzheimer's was diagnosed, was at autopsy. But the truth of the matter is that during their lives, they had perfectly normal cognitive function. Before we talk about your 12-week program, I'm just curious in terms of of diagnostic advances and, and therapeutic advances, I mean, will we get to a point where someone can have a brain scan and say, okay, here's the status of your tangles and plaques and here's what you need to do? Because brain imagery, you know, I've always found it so interesting, even when you talk about like antidepressants and, and, you know, serotonin reuptake inhibitors or whatever they're called, SS, is is that right? SSRIs, yep. Yeah, that, that, you know, there was never a way until recently to kind of measure how the brain was reacting. They would just kind of, it would be very anecdotal. You kind of throw it against the wall to see what sticks. And now we have so much better brain imagery so will that translate into dementia and Alzheimer's and, and preventative strategies that we could follow? I think, I think so. I mean, we're, we're making a lot of progress on brain imaging, and you're absolutely right. I mean, the brain has long been sort of considered this black box, only measured by its inputs and its outputs. You really couldn't get a, a, a good idea of its internal machinery, but now we can. I mean, I, I don't know that we're at the point yet where we can determine degree of severity of, of dementia based on a scan. Do you think we will, do you think we'll get to that point though, Sanjay? I think we'll get to the point where we can very quantifiably measure the, the, the burden of plaques and tangles and other things in the brain. But, we'll, but again, what I think is so extraordinary, Katie, is that you could have two people with the exact same scan essentially and very different clinical pictures. One person may be completely debilitated, obviously uh, having dementia, and the other person may be functionally, cognitively normal. Right. And I, 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 again, I, I, look, 
do I, I don't want to, I don't want to have plaques and tangles in my brain, but mostly what I don't want to have is the cognitive dysfunction that comes with that. It's a different way of thinking. It really is. Like, I think, again, we focus so much on making someone's images look better or whatever. And what the person really wants is them to be better. And there right, are ways right. to do that, you know, with lifestyle changes. So I mean, I'm a neurosurgeon instance, saying this, by the way. Just remember that because I'm a specialist. That's that's what I was trained to do. And yet I'm now becoming increasingly convinced that these types of changes that we talk about in this book really uh, can, can prevent you from developing the symptoms. Yeah, I was going to say, so you're saying that brain scans are just part of the story. It's sort of like it, it's half of the story because even with them, you could have these cognitive reserves developed and be very asymptomatic. Well, let's talk about this 12-week program, uh, Sharp. Take us through the steps because I'm all ears. The, 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 um, so it's, it's 12 weeks where I basically, uh, based on how I think your brain is going to change uh, and, and react to things that you're now doing that are different or new, um, it all sort of builds on itself. I start off by really making sure you get the basics right. And I'll tell you, it's it's not that complicated. There are a few big messages in terms of the overall getting it the substrate right. And as you might guess, diet, nourishment is one of them. But the, but the big the big takeaway here is I think generally people know what a healthy diet is. And for those who don't, there's some information in there about what's specifically healthy for the brain. There are some distinctions between the brain and the body in this regard. One is one is sugar. Um, you know, we, we, we talk a lot about sugar and people know that they shouldn't eat too much sugar. We used to get sugar, you know, twice a year when fruit fell from the trees. Even honey was protected by the bees. And now we're eating 130 pounds a year on average of sugar. But what was, what was a learning point for me was that the brain is exquisitely sensitive to sugar. So typically you eat a lot of sugar and you think, well, that's being absorbed into cells. I have a lot of energy, whatever it might be. These, these, these are a lot of calories that are now providing me energy. The brain, as soon as sugar levels get beyond a certain point, and it's a pretty narrow range, the receptors basically shut down. So you could run into a situation where you're taking in a lot of calories, a lot of energy, and starving your brain at the same time. And that is, that is a situation that leads to a whole, a whole cascade of events that you can pretty easily avoid. So that's, you know, the, as much as I talk about in the first few weeks of what to do, there are several things that you're told not to do, just to avoid. And that's, that's more than half the battle, and they're not that hard to do. I also try to make the case for things like sleep, which you've read a lot about, I've read a lot about, but reminding people just how metabolically active the brain is during sleep. And this wonderful conversation that I'm having with you right now will be encoded into my hippocampus if I get good sleep tonight so that 20 years from now I can recall this and remember it. A lot of times people say that they can't remember something. It's not that they can't rem- it's not that they forgot it. It's that they never actually stored it in their memory centers in the first place. So these are strategies to help that. But then, you know, sort of the midpoint of the book is really about the, the evidence-based things that we know improve brain health. Starts off by asking you to define what you think a healthy brain is. What is a healthy brain? We know what a healthy heart is. It pumps a certain amount of blood out with each beat. But what is a healthy brain, you know? And, and I spend a little bit of time talking through talking the reader through how they define that because it is different for different people. Robert Sapolsky, who is this evolutionary biologist, I was interviewing him and he, yeah, and never forget, he said to me that a healthy brain is a, is a, is a brain that has a bigger circle of you is what he said, which basically means you let more people into your circle. Now, why is that relevant? Well, it's relevant in, in you know, ancient times because you were more likely to be protected by the group. But now it's this idea of, of what true, connection does for for protection of the brain. That's fascinating because I've been reading a lot and trying to develop a documentary on loneliness. And, you know, Vivek Murthy, as you know, did together, uh, wrote that book, The Surgeon General during the Obama administration. And is he this new Surgeon General too now? He got confirmed. He's doing it again. <laughs> so yes. he's, he's the Surgeon General again. And of course, he cares deeply about this. And I've done a ton of research on loneliness and social isolation. 
And that's so fascinating to me because Sanjay, of course, we're talking about overall emotional well-being, but the fact that that connection has such a significant impact on brain health um, is really interesting too. Too. And 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 now uh, to your earlier point, measurable. You know, a lot of what we talk about is 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 based on objective data that we couldn't collect some time ago. But I will tell you something fascinating that you know, if you're doing this documentary, because I find this this topic really interesting. But there's this loneliness researcher named Stephanie Cacioppa. She's an Oregon. I know, I know, and she's in at the in Chicago. Her husband John was. Her husband was one of the preeminent scientists about memory and then he died he died i know and now she's in oregon and i talk to her from time to time it's been tough as you might imagine and she's by herself in oregon which you know as a loneliness researcher through this pandemic has been such a significant thing for her but she said this thing to me that i'll never forget and in and i talk a little bit about it in the book which is we talk about connection like right now you and i get to zoom and have this call about you know this this conversation that's very interesting to me most connections that we have with friends, maybe even family to some extent, are pretty cursory. How you doing? I'm doing fine. How you doing? I'm doing fine. You know, it's, it's how do you get to a level of more profound connection? Because it wasn't, as you've well heard, it's not about the number of connections you have. It's about the quality. But what does that mean, quality? And one thing Stephanie said to me was a, a, a sort of shortcut to building the quality and the high intensity connection is to be vulnerable, to ask for help, to share your problems, which is totally counterintuitive to how I think about things. I would rather not burden somebody with things. But I took it to heart and I was talking to my parents who were in their late 70s in Florida through this pandemic. And we were having those conversations. How you doing? How are the girls? That was the conversation for months. And I said to them, I asked them a question about a problem I was having with one of my cars that my wife's car had some smoke coming from the hood. They're both engineers. And for days, Katie, we started to have these really interesting conversations about cars, about their history of being interested in engineering and all this stuff. Figure out the way to build the meaningful connection. Um, that, that, is, that is probably one of the most critical points. And, and there, there are pretty easy ways to do it. That's, that's incredible. You know, I, I'm thinking about so many things with that, Sanjay. One, is I don't know about you, but when I go to funerals, uh, people I thought I knew or you know knew casually, and I I learn about them through the eulogies that are delivered. I always think, why didn't I know that? Why didn't I talk to that person about their interest in that or the this you know such and such a why didn't I talk to them about it? Why didn't I know that they had experienced something? And it always fills me with regret. And it also makes me realize that we don't really know people and how cursory, as you're, you point out, our relationships are. Similarly, when you talk about your parents, you know, I'm writing a memoir right now and, you know, I'm going through old photographs from the late 1800s of my ancestors and you know, and I'm thinking a real gift for a family is to really learn about their history and to really, you know, uh, interview. And, you know, I found all kinds of things in my parents' house and I have no idea the provenance. I found a porcelain baby doll head in my mom's drawer in her dresser. And I, I wish I knew where that came from. And I wish, you know, it's also tied into our, our fear of mortality and we don't want to talk about death, but I wish my mom had taken me through her things and said, this was from my great grandmother who came from, you know, you know, I knew sort of vaguely about our family history, but I've gotten a much deeper understanding, uh, but I wish I had known more. And I would encourage everyone to interview their parents and really, you know, for generations to come because so much family history is lost. And I'm so glad you're having those conversations with your parents. And, you know, you should record them for your daughters and write them down. And um, and then, you know, it's such a gift for them to know themselves better and know their families better. 
Oh, oh yeah. I mean, th- th- there's no question. And I think that they're they're pretty willing years right now. You know, they, they've become very interested in, in our family history. But I, I think that the, the, the thing for my parents as well, I mean, obviously it's good for me to, to know that part of our history. But my parents, you know, I in some ways when I reached out to them, it was just it was purely in this like pandemic mode. How are you doing? I know connections important. Am I doing a good enough job as a son making that connection? I'm your son. I should be part of like that meaningful connection to you. And I'm not sure I'm doing it right now because uh, the conversations are, str- I mean, not strangely cursory, but they're cursory. And yeah. and and, he, and and when you are a little vulnerable, parents don't want to be parents. And even though I'm, you know, a grown man, they still like if I ask them for help, my dad's got his reading glasses on. He's slipping through the manuals and, you know, he wants to help and it gives them purpose. Um, Again, I think the tendency is always I don't want to burden you. But if you ask them to do what you're just saying, you know, pull out the pictures and show me the mementos and take me through your life. um, It's great for me and it's great for them. I agree. Sorry, we got off track a teeny bit there, but I think you're right. I think the point is connection, deep connection is good for your brain. Yes. And good for you. And I think, you know, it, it's good for you in general. It, 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 the, 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 the data around this stuff now is what's compelling. Like I think so many times in medicine, even in public health, you have, you have an inclination that this is going to be true, or you look at societies around the world where, they have no heart disease or no dementia or whatever. And you say, well, what, what is it about these societies? But now we have, uh, it can be pretty pretty prescriptive, you know, in, in a way, and, and it all makes sense. So the last part of the 12-week program, I'll just tell you quickly, is more about what we started talking about initially, which is then how do you create, now that I've primed your brain for neurogenesis, given you all the right amounts of the right hormones, not too much epinephrine, but enough oxytocin, and all that sort of is, is happening by going through the first few weeks of the program, now how do you build the new brain cells? And that gets to a lot of what we are talking about in terms of that cognitive reserve. You know, actually um, uh, doing these different types of activities, doing similar activities in a totally different way, doing things with different people, doing them at different times, eliminating certain things completely from your regimen for a while, adding in something totally unrelated. It's it was fascinating to me. I tried it. I, I, I based this entire thing on my conversations with these neuroscientists who all tried it and written about it and published it in journals. It's fun. It's a fun ride. I was going to say, so give me some ideas real quickly before we go about things I could do. Should I take a pottery class? Should I learn Italian? Should I pick up the guitar? What should I do? I think that, you know, I think the two big ingredients are it's got to be something you really haven't done before. This isn't about trying to, again, build a two lane highway where you're used to driving one. This is about getting to, you know, to Italy instead of staying in New York or or going somewhere even different, Argentina, you know, totally different. If you can do something that involves your 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 hands like pottery or painting, even better. That was something that came up over and over again. And then the second ingredient, I guess, and this is a little bit more vague, is that it's it's good if it makes you a little uncomfortable. I, I and I know that sounds almost euphemistic or too easy or too simple, but the whole point is that when you start to release certain hormones in the body, like some stress hormones, stress can be good. It really helps that process of neurogenesis. So a little bit of discomfort with something totally new, preferably using your hands, that's a pretty good prescription. Before we go, can you tell me uh, about foods that are healthy brain foods? I know that you hear about fish, you hear about nuts, you hear about extra virgin olive oil. Are all those things sort of good brain food? And what else should I be eating other than staying away from the cupcakes? (laughs) <laughs> yeah, no, I, I, right. Yes, definitely do it's sh- the sugar thing I mentioned already. So, I mean, that's just, that's just a, I think you could accomplish 70% of all the other things by basically uh, just eliminating added sugar from your diet. But I think the adage, what is good for the heart is good for the brain remains true. But I think with the brain, there are a few, few distinctions. One is if an apple a day keeps a doctor away, then berries are what's good for the brain. Berries, really good data around berries, really start to add berries into your diet. I think that's one of the big ones. And while 
most of the neuroscientists did not advocate a caloric restriction diet necessarily, a calorie reduced diet overall to the extent that you can do it. We create a lot of metabolic byproducts from, from overeating and a lot of those metabolic byproducts get accumulated in the brain. So uh, if you can cut down on the amount of, of energy that has to be metabolized in that way, you can make a lot of progress. Even though berries may be good for your brain, you don't believe in this whole idea of supplements or superfoods, do you? No, I, I, you know, I think superfood, first of all, is a really vaguely defined term uh, as part of this book. I asked a lot of people, and I even talked to your friend Mark Hyman about this as well. It's, it, doesn't, it, it doesn't have a, a really uh, objective meaning. There are some foods that are maybe better than others. But I think the thing about supplements that struck me was, was the idea that for certain people who have deficiencies, then supplementing that part of their diet is important. But, you know, Katie, in this country... Uh, and I'm not advocating this, but in this country, even the standard American diet, like if you go to a McDonald's even, the food is largely fortified, you know, with all these different vitamins and micronutrients and things like that. That That is a decision that our USDA made decades ago to fortify food so that people wouldn't develop basic nutritional deficiencies. So oftentimes we're supplementing something that doesn't need to be supplemented. A lot of a lot of the, 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 the approach is in more in terms of what you're not eating versus what you are eating. And that that you know that holds up to be true. So berries I, I single out because they are one of these foods whose active ingredients are particularly good at crossing the blood brain barrier, particularly good at creating these scaffoldings, you know, for the, the neurogenesis that we talked about earlier. So I, I put that high on the list. I'm going to have a smoothie as soon as we're done with this with blackberries, blueberries there. You've got one, too. Since since I since the book, this is my the gift that my wife gives me every day. She makes berry smoothie. This is just berries. It's uh, primarily strawberries, um, but it's some uh, I don't even know what she put in here today. Raspberries, I think a few other things and ice. And that's it. In your Michigan cup. I love it. I love in my it. Michigan cup. Yes. <laughs> Go blue. <laughs> um, okay. But what about, you know, I see this stuff in the drugstore and I'm like, oh, should I be taking like Prevagen or should I be taking, what is it like almost, isn't it like jellyfish der derivatives and stuff? And I'm like, should I be doing that? Well, you know, I, the Prevagen one is interesting because, you know, Eric Kandel is, is very involved with this, and he's a very prominent uh, neuroscientist, did a lot of the uh, original jellyfish research, basically trying to figure out where the memory stores were in jellyfish, how jellyfish remembered, and, and isolating those stores, and basically creating a supplement. It's a fascinating idea. I don't know that it really works. I mean, it's very hard to study this sort of thing. You know, it takes decades-long studies to prove that something like that's improving memory. What we do have is, is decades-long data on societies around the world where dementia is essentially so rare that it's reportable. You know, if somebody developed dementia, you'd report that in the medical journal. That's how... Inf what are they doing? What are those societies doing right? What's the, what's the yes. magic bullet? That, so that's the, a lot of what I wrote about in the book is based on some of that epidemiological data. But, uh, but, and, I, and I will tell you that, what, what those things are. But my, my point is, though, that with these, we don't need to have the supplements. We know it's possible to be done because we see it having already transpired real time in large societies across the, the world. And, and in those societies, you know, I, I took the neuroscientific data that we had and tried to see, are, are they in some ways applying that unwittingly? I mean, they didn't read these papers, obviously, but were they sort of uh, just by default, essentially, uh, following that, that right diet, following that right amount of movement, uh, following the right amount of rest? So movement, for example, I'll just tell you, this was an interesting one. Maybe you know this. You probably do. You know a lot of things. But the, the, if you look at movement, it's probably the only thing that has has the longest amount of evidence behind it in terms of actually creating neurogenesis. All of this is new research, but that, that's sort of the oldest new research. But what was fascinating to me was that what does movement mean to people, right? I use the word movement instead of exercise because what they found was that moderate movement, brisk walking, that tended to be a lot better for neurogenesis than intense exercise. Now, why would that be? Well, it turns out that when you briskly exercise, 
you're releasing a lot of what is known as brain-derived neurotrophic factor. That's kind of like the miracle grow for, for your brain, as was described. If you are intensely exercising, you also tend to release a lot of epinephrine. And epinephrine is actually a blocker. It's a, it's a cascade blocker of what BDNF, this neurotrophic factor, does. I know I'm throwing a lot of language no, at you. No, but that's what okay. I'm, I'm, I'm following. Intense exercise may be great for your heart and, and you know, maybe even weight loss, whatever your goals may be. But for your brain, intense exercise actually is not good. And you find that can actually be a little bit destructive by releasing these stress hormones that block the beneficial effects that exercise should have on your brain. I never knew that. And wow. it, it, so like, I think I go for a walk uh, as often as I can with Rebecca. Now that wasn't something I did. I was out there thinking I got 40 minutes. I'm going to go hard. That was my sort of approach. And sometimes I still feel the need to do that, but walking is great. Brisk here, here, here's, here's the best way to do it. If you want to just make it for your brain, take a brisk walk with a close friend or family member and talk about your problems. And that sort of brings all these things together in some ways that we've been talking about. Take your take your 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 berry smoothie with you, and, and you've pretty much nailed it. And 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 what? How do you how do you um, what constitutes brisk? I I, I just want to know, like, how, like you can still talk. You can still have the conversation. Was basically how it was described to me. I mean, there there's different you know heart rate targets and things like that, but that was basically uh, basically it. You want to get the heart rate up a bit. The heart rate that's ideal for overall over, overall metabolism is typically a lot lower than people realize. There's ways to calculate that. I put that in the book as well. But as a general rule, you're having that conversation with your friend. Maybe even it's a passionate conversation because you're talking about problems and unburdening yourself and being vulnerable and all that. But that's the walk. That's the pace. I want to ask you uh, two more things, Sanjay. And, and, um I'm curious about social media and the way we live our lives. You know, we're constantly distracted. We have constant incoming information. Our attention spans have shortened. I read a fascinating study a while ago that said the part of your brain, I, I think it's a hippocampus, you can correct me if I'm wrong, responsible for, for creativity. It, it only fires up when you're bored. And that's why you have so many great ideas when you're in the sh in shower when you're not distracted or when you're taking a long walk and you don't have your phone with you. And I'm curious the impact of all this mental stimulus or stimuli has on neurogenesis and keeping our brains healthy. Go. Go. Yeah, yeah. Okay. That, that, that's a, it's a great topic. And I approach it as a person who wrote this book, but frankly, also as a dad of three teenage girls, because and this is conversation topic number one in our household all the time. And and I'll t and I'll tell you two things that actually came out of a dinner time conversation I recently had, um, I, and I try not to be too preachy with with my girls. Although sometimes I can say I don't use this line often, but I can say I did write a book about that. The girls hate it when I do that, but it's true, and I, and I can use that as a wild card to actually get them to listen to what I'm saying about the fact that when you are distracted like that, and you think maybe even you are multitasking. The brain is actually not that good at multitasking. It actually requires a lot of energy to shift back and forth between things, between scrolling through your social media feed, trying to have a conversation, trying to look your dad in the eye when he's talking to you, whatever it might be. It's, it's hard to transition back and forth between all these things. We think we're being efficient, and we're not, because the amount of energy it takes to actually make the switch is a lot higher than we realize. That's kind of novel thinking, because, you know, it's always been about multitasking. How, how many things can I do at the same time? But the second thing, which I think is, you know, I worry about the most, and I think is what you're saying as well, is that leaving aside just the content on social media for a second and just the fact that it's so incessant, like you're saying, when we talk about stress and on the brain and on the body, stress in and of itself is not the enemy. I mean, in fact, we need stress. I was a little nervous to do this podcast with you today because I have so much respect for you, but it makes me a little stressed because I have that nervousness. But it's good. I need that because I prepared for this. But the problem is that we can't get a break from the stress. We, that's the real problem. Robert Sapolsky, the guy I mentioned earlier, wrote a book called Why Zebras Don't Get Ulcers. 
And I love the title, but it basically means that a zebra is getting chased and it has tons of stress hormones and it's running for its life. And then as soon as the threat is gone, it's grazing and it's totally relaxed and it never gets an ulcer. It knows how to turn the stress off. Social media, screens, the incessant nature of it make it very difficult for us to ever turn the stress off. We don't want to turn it off completely or never have it. That would not be a worthy or or possible goal. But we don't get breaks from it. And that's what I worry about the most with, with my girls, myself to some extent, although I'm much more aware of it. But that's what I worry about. Katie. So 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 you're saying that it's really important to put the phones down, put them away, even studies that show if it's on a table, it's distracting, but by its very presence, because you can't have a deep focused conversation with that thing in your line, of, line sight. of sight. Right. That that that, that it, the, the the distraction, just the presence of it, whatever it may be, it takes you away from from being in the moment. And and again, I know some of this sounds so euphemistic, but and maybe you've heard it all before, but now the data is there. I mean, I mean the, I, the smartphone has only really been around since 2005, Katie. I mean, think about that, 15 years. And it's not that long. And we've had some of the biggest behavioral shifts ever recorded in human history during that time. I don't know if you, if you read Gene Twang's book, iGen. Yes, I did. I did. And, you know, I did a whole hour for Nat Geo on technology and how it's robbing us of our humanity. And, um, and, and I'm a big fan of hers and, and how she, her observations about societal change. But yes, I did. But what were you going to say? Sorry. Well, no, I mean, I, I read it as well. And, you know, you know, the little things that she put in there, like kids, 12th graders nowadays are less likely to go out than eighth graders did a generation ago. They're right, less likely right. to drive. They're less likely to drink, but they're more likely to be sitting on their bed on social media. And she worries about this burgeoning you know, public mental health epidemic as a result. Not to mention, not to mention sort of uh, the suicide rates are really, really scary, Sanjay. You know, it, people from, I, I was reading six to 12 year olds are having suicidal ideation. And my friend walked by an apartment building not far from where we live. And a 12 year old boy had jumped out of the window uh, and it was just, I mean, we really have to pay attention to this because it's just so heartbreaking. And uh, I mean, it's such an epidemic. It, it, it's, um, it, it really is. And I mean, I, I don't even know how to, I can't even imagine, you know. Uh, terrible. Ter- parents terrible. of a 12-year-old. I, I just, I don't know. I guess this, I have kids that age. It's, it's really hard to absorb that. You talk about kind of constant stress and you need stress and then recovery. I guess that's because your, your brain is producing too much cortisol, right? I mean, the stress hormone, or is it doing a lot of other stuff uh, physiologically? It, it, I, think, I think the thing that, that uh, is, is becoming clearer is that the absolute amount may not be as important as how long your cells are, are sort of exposed to the, to the stress hormone. You can have these amazingly high spikes, and, and they saw this uh, in people, fighter pilots, people who are in these incredible situations for periods of time, really high spikes, so high, in fact, that the blood vessels in the back of their eyes would change. They would have to account for blurriness of vision because their, their, their epinephrine spikes so high. But... When they weren't in in that situation, they had incredibly low levels of stress, really high heart rate variability. Heart rate variability is a really interesting measure of this because if you have high heart rate variability, that's good. That means you, that means your 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 blood vessels aren't clamped down by all the stress hormones. They they're they're kind of loose and can and the variability is good. And so it wasn't the spikes in, in cortisol, epinephrine, other stress hormones as much as it was them staying plateauing at an, at an unreasonably high level. Interesting. When it comes to stress in closing, because I've kept you far too long, Sanjay, but I could talk to you all day, is <laughs> what is the impact of this year plus of really for many people, this constant stress? And how is that going to, in your view, affect us in terms of collective trauma? Well, you know, the honest answer, Katie, is I, I don't know. 
Um, I've looked back historically at other significant traumas that we've endured as a nation, and even going back to the 1918 flu pandemic. Howard Markell is this medical historian who's written a lot about this very issue, everything from is this basically an erupted time or is it a transformative time is sort of how, you know, people are thinking about it. And I don't know. I, I, I will say, and, and again, I, I try very hard not to be euphemistic because this has been a really, really significant trauma, uh, you know, as, as we talked about overall about COVID. But, you know, the 1918 flu pandemic was also followed by the Roaring Twenties. You know, there was this earnest return to normalcy. And there were a lot of hangover effects. You know, um, people did. There, there was mask debates back then as well. People, But there were still people who wore masks for periods of time. Ventilation in buildings changed all across America because we recognized the, the difference. And so I think that was very empowering for people to say, hey, look, we endured this, but now we're empowered to, to make ourselves more protected or safer from it happening again. And that was, was, was healing, according to some of these medical historians I spoke to, to actually just feel empowered to do something. It's the helplessness and the uncertainty that is the most traumatic. The uncertainty has been really problematic this year. A novel virus, we have no idea how long it's going to last. That uncertainty is really, really uh, perhaps the most toxic thing. When you can start to inject certainty back into the equation, uh, to some extent, that goes a long way. And, you know, um, again, you correctly point out the divide. I don't want to speak for everybody because there's some people who have been much harder hit. you got 40,000 COVID orphans in this country, 40,000 minors who've lost one or both parents as a result of this. I mean, what what happens to them? I remember the children uh, of people who died during 9-11 and wondering what their lives are going to be like 10 years, 40,000 times that happened this past year. So, you know, I, I think that's, I, I would never want to in any way whitewash any of that. That's going to be significant. But historically, we do tend to rebound quickly. We forget and move on quickly, but hopefully, I guess, we don't forget some of the important lessons here. What about just the impact on the brain itself? Any idea, Sanjay, what this sort of, you know, unrelenting stress over a long period of time is going to do to our brains, not just to our kind of emotional psyches? You, you know, we, we have we have pretty pretty good data on what these stress hormones in prolonged periods of time do to the brain. Um, we've you know we're, we're that's been documented now in all sorts of different studies. Nothing quite like this, obviously, because this is so unique. And that's why I still preface by saying I don't know for sure. With great humility, I try and answer some of these questions. But I think th- there will be an impact. But I think that we've also learned that we can grow new brain cells, though. We can recover from that. We can uh, create situations where it doesn't become such a incessant memory that it, that it basically leads to post-traumatic stress, which is a real concern as well. There will be people that have significant amounts of post-traumatic stress, but our ability to treat that, to recognize it, is, is better than before, and our ability to, to, to build new brain cells to help compensate is better than before. So impact significant, but solutions, you know, emerging as well. So it is possible to heal. I hear you say. It is possible to heal. And, and we, we, we've seen it before, you know, with other, even other pandemics. 